myself just to be sure. And um, I'd like to, um, I'm delighted to uh, let uh, Eamon and Tom talk about some of the research that they've been doing around um, open access publishing. So they'll be presenting a session on open and shut an analysis of open access pub publishing in hybrid educational technology journals. Um, so I'll hand over to you, um, uh, Eamon and Tom, do you what, just want me to give you okay. a, a thank you. Win five minutes. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Uh, Eamon's going to take off, go. so I'll knock off my mic now and uh, I'll come in then. Okay, best of luck, Eamon. Drive on. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And uh, thank you, Verena. I hope people can hear me. Please reassure me that you can hear me by just typing in the chat there. Um, I think Verena's gave us a wonderful presentation on a research and she ended on, on, the, on a note where she said whether they choose to be an open, open learner uh, and or an open student. But what we're going to talk about is something related and it's about open scholarship, whether you choose to be an open scholarship or whether you don't choose or not. Um, in contrast to Verena's fantastic research, this is not primary research. We don't know what the participants uh, involved in publishing, what their motivations are, are. We're just looking at some indirect evidence of the publications they've produced, sometimes known as psionometrics. Uh, but we're trying to interrogate a bit about open access publishing and what that looks like and where people publish, how they publish, uh, what that is. And the title of this article, it's based on a um, an article we published in Erodal um, earlier this year. And I'm just going to type in the chat, and there's a, some tweets there that I summarized the article in. If you, uh, if, if you don't get a chance to read it, you can see that, or if you're still none the wiser following this session. But um, one of this, the, the, the terms there in it is, is in the title of the, of the article is hybrid uh, journal, hybrid educational technology journals. So as soon as we had this published, I thought that's actually not a great title because it's not maybe immediately apparent to people what hybrid actually means. It's possibly a bit of a jargonistic term. It's, it's from the literature and it means you can publish both closed access and open access in the same journal. Um, but I'm also minded of uh, Kurt Vonnegut's um, uh, admonition against using uh, jargon. And he, he had a great one in the, in the novel Cat's Cradle. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Cat's Cradle and Kurt Vonnegut. I'm just going to paste in the chat a great quote. It was just mine um, uh, from Kurt Vonnegut in his novel Cat's Cradle about, about charlatans and, and the dangers of using jargon. So basically, hybrid really means closed journal. So let's go on. Uh, so we're going to look at the prevalence of different access types of article published in these prominent educational technology journals with a hybrid publishing model that publish open and closed. In reality, as you'll see, they're really just sort of closed journals by and large. If you want to publish by the in the most open of open access forms, you usually pay an article processing charge or you have that waived. Um, so those are some of the things we wanted to look at. And how we went about that was we conducted a literature review and we looked at what other scholars are doing in different areas looking at open access publishing. Uh, we used a, a great service called Unpaywall, which is a Canadian uh, uh, not-for-profit company doing amazing work. They're cataloging all of the research in the world of this amazing data set and seeing what, what levels of open access it is or not. Um, and we then verified a lot of the data from, from Scopus in particular using hand searches, manual searches of the journal websites. And we also looked for what process, article processing charge these journals are citing. And then we analyzed all this. Um, so an interesting thing about it is um, we we found a, a disparity in some of these sources when we looked at journals and, and what they were publishing, and there were some differences. Uh, Scopus doesn't index everything. Um, on paywall is a much more accurate description of open access, and perhaps that a like, journal is owned by Elsevier, which is a big publisher in itself. And maybe there's less incentive for publishers to to show what's really open access. Certainly, they don't show green open access, which I 
should mention in a, in a bit. So this picture here shows a bit about our results. And it shows you that the general proportion, 89%, 90% of articles are in this, uh, um, uh, this, this big black area here. Um, let's see if I use my pointer, not really. Uh, yeah, so yeah, exactly, that's the one. So, uh, and then there's green over here. And does anybody know what this green box is? Anybody want to hazard a guess as to what green means? And gold here, and then another little box gray down here. Um, yeah, that's exactly it, Lindsay. Yeah, it can be, it can be e-prints or sometimes known as preprints. Exactly, Caroline. Yeah. Uh, it generally means you've you've put it in a, an institutional repository or a preprint server, self-published. Exactly. Yeah. Um, now, most of the people in this huge big black box here could actually be publishing in this green one if they knew a bit more about it. Um, so let's look at that a bit further. So you can see there's been a bit of increase in this, in, sorry, in the gold bar at the bottom. Uh, and would anybody like to hazard a guess as to what the, the gold part might mean? Anybody has it to guess what gold open access is? Yeah, Not quite, Gemma. Of course. Well, it, yes, no, you're right. It does mean an open access journal. Yeah. But th the problem is that fully open access journals only comprise a fraction of the entire journal landscape. And a danger is that we can get into a bit of a bubble. Those fantastic journals like Erodal or Research and Learn Technology, Alts Journal, which are amazing journals that don't charge APCs as well. So there's different types of open access journals. Journals some charge APCs, some are subsidised by learning societies and professional bodies. So, but these ones, the gold ones, basically say Creative Commons. If you go onto the website. And this little gray sliver here is a kind of a, an interesting category just above the gold. These are ones that are free on the journal website, but what we're, what we're cautioning is that um, we're, this is a kind of a gray area. It's a bit murky, this, this area, because they're free on a journal website, and a lot of people think they're open access, but really the journal are just turning that on and off, and you have no rights to really use that in your students. You can't download it. Um, so it's it's a bit complex, and we, we, we really think that those should be counted as closed articles. So for instance, say you have a course in your institution, you maybe have a, have a graduate program, and you want your students to read articles. This is never more apparent than now. Maybe they, they can't go on campus to access uh, articles and so on, or you're trying to reach learners from around the world, and they don't have the same uh, rights to, to these journals as you do, um, these may not be available to them. And they're often used just to drive traffic to a journal website as well, so they may make something free. It's also a kind of term of a, a type of open washing whereby journals may say, oh, our articles are free, particularly highly cited articles, and they can drive uh, hits, citations, all this to the, to the publisher websites. Um, so the, the, the publishers are essentially, they own the journals and they get revenue and it's a very, very big business. And we're going to show some of the numbers we estimated that, uh, if people were to pay these article processing charges of all these, uh, prominent journals, what, what that would have cost and what that looks like. And it's a big, it's a huge, big topical area at the moment. Um, content marketing. Can you send me a, a link to that, Will, and I'll check that out. I'm not fully sure what, what you mean exactly, but give me give me, give me me a, a, a primer on that, and I'd, I'd love to check that out. Um, <clears throat> so basically, so I say in my institution, Lost Leaders, yeah, they, we have a, I have a privilege to have a really good access to loads of um, journals through a, con a collective agreement of the Irish universities that they negotiate with the big publishers. 
But the problem is I don't really notice that I have access because I'm on campus. It seems I'm geolocated by my firewall. I have access to all this literature. It's only kind of when I'm at a conference or maybe I'm at home and I'm not on a VPN that I don't notice that all these articles are locked up behind paywalls. And there's a lot of educational research that I can't have access to or my students can't and so on. So with that, I'm going to hand over to um, Tom for the next remainder of this session. And I think we have the, we don't have the second presenter, Tom, in case you... Yeah, sorry, we, 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 we've hidden them there. Just a little um, reference there to Money for Nothing uh, from... from um their straits. Um, as I said, it's a staggeringly profitable business. Where else would you actually get people um, to, to give you their work for free? And then uh, then they actually, if you want, if they want to have their work to be more readily accessible, they then pay the reader. Uh, they then pay the, the, the publisher to present. It's great. As I said, it's like asking a builder to build a wall. And then you ask the builder then to pay for the privilege then of, of actually people coming and looking at the wall. It's a great, it's a great idea. So, and I think particularly now, um, as Eamon just said there, those of us in higher education, we, we're fairly cosseted. But what about all the people who, who've been our students, those people who went out to be nurses and doctors and teachers and all of those professions where we talk about the importance of evidence-based practice, but actually you can't get access to, to evidence a lot of the a lot of the time. So we just the, the, the cost per publishers here there. Uh, and as I said, you know, quite quite a uh, so as a matter of interest, are people surprised or did the prices seem about right or did uh, any thoughts uh, on and did they think they were higher or just as I said that we, we haven't had that about right yet and that's and the, the the thing about it is if you are an early career researcher, so we have this you know situation where you know, in order to get up the ladder, you have to be published in the journal of really important, you know, floral arrangement or wherever that happens to be, and then you know you're 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 actually asked to pay, you know, quite a, quite a lot of money to get your to get your uh, your papers out there. So quite a, 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 an amount of money there. We then, as I said, we just articles pay at the article or author processing to the publisher to publish gold uh, open access, and I suppose that's the thing there. Um, one of the big things was that idea around what do we mean by the journal titles and as I said strictly speaking open access means gold open access when you're actually paying an auto processing charge. Myself and Eamon are editors of the Irish Journal of Technology Enhanced Learning and we would be more accurately described as a platinum or a diamond journal because we don't charge our readers to read it nor our authors to publish so that's that's strictly speaking whereas say when gold we think about paying uh, so the, the articles could cost the authors up to this amount of money if we extrapolate those figures and then we looked at the number of articles that uh, people had paid. So quite a lot of money there when we extrapolated those figures. But we then went, if all of those 8,425 articles in the corpus had paid an APC to have gold access, this would have cost $21 million. So I think that's... Uh, no, I, I agree with you, Martin. Not just a problem for early career research, but as I said, for, for all people. But what I meant there was that people who are more established may have access to 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 research funding, to institutional funding, which are quite right. It's an, an issue for everybody. But as I said, um, those eight and a half thousand. And when we talk about the the search, uh, yeah, uh, doing the manual hand search certainly uh, was a, a difficult problem. And that was one of the other issues there, which which uh, arose that even when you actually go looking through the papers, it's often quite hard. Sometimes you, you have to drill right down. Um, so we all thought the idea of of the open access logo would help, but um, it's not always as easy to find open access as as you would imagine. But as I said, certainly just going back here, twenty one million if that was eight and a half thousand. Now we've we've extrapolated a little bit, but certainly you can see it, it's it's a hell of a lot of money there. That's that idea of the fool's gold, and uh, Amy just briefly talked about the, the the grey. And one of the things we've done that this is a, a, a this is an additional thing. This is not in the erodal paper which was published earlier this year, but just we've also tracked those free papers. And in September um, eighteen, uh, the there was one hundred and sixty one of that body, and by December just gone that 161 had gone down to 41. So that's a hell of a drop there. So 
as I said, it's it, it's it's a fool's gold in many ways there. So whether uh, journals are using it as a way of enticing readers into into an, a particular issue, but as I said, those free papers are not not particularly uh, very useful useful data there like that. Uh, much larger sample. Uh, Andy, I don't fancy doing a hand search of 23 million papers. No, I'm only joking. Um, but thank, no, thank you very much for that for that suggestion there. So as I said, the, the, one of the things that Eamon just mentioned there about the green open access, we certainly think that you can see a lot more people shifting from the green and into the black and, and, and taking you know more of that black because certainly it would appear that there's a lot more options open for those pre-prints, those er, early editions there. So you know, thanks very much, man. and there's only only joking about that. Um, but as I said, you know, I think that's where I think the, the the librarians in particular have a great role to play in. You know, we'll be talking about facilitating open scholarship. Is that um, you know the things are changing so much now. So I think we're, we're under pressure to try and understand all the nuances. So I think certainly uh, we should always look for options where we can get out green versions of of our paper. Um, Ideally, I, we will see far more, uh, you know, gold open access uh, and and not at a big fees. But in the meantime, I think certainly you need to think do near green open access. Overall, then, I say our findings highlight that most of the research is behind paywalls, and by and large, it would still seem to be a minority activity for a lot of the scholars there. And you know, as I said, so th there is. I think I think the complexity and the costs uh, may be inhibiting uh, accessibility. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with uh, are familiar with, the, with what happened there. We were about 15 months ago or so. Research Gate, um, the the Centre for Responsible Publishing, which is basically a res an organisation representing uh, publishers, uh, insisted on Research Gate taking down. I think something in in, in the order of 1.2 or 1.4 million. Uh, papers which which were up there and, and shouldn't have been up there. So as I said, if people start to understand the, the the nuances, because I think there's a lot of people who are philosophically committed to openness, but in reality uh, they need they need some guidance and, and help. So for the research here, we're required to explore the factors and finding out. So you know the, the idea of a focus uh, our focus of a follow up study then is to it's actually ascertain points of people who have published uh, open access in hybrid journals. Why do they do it? So as I said, I think a lot of people talk about openness as a self evident good, and a lot of people are philosophically committed to it. But the reality is, as I said, like you know. Uh, we need help and support and guidance uh, to do that. I think the Plan S in Europe will certainly, or hopefully, have uh, have an impact. But as I said, uh, if we want to look upon uh, open journals or journals as a, a form of OER, we need to help provide support uh, uh, and guidance for those who want to be open scholars. So this is, as I said, there's Eamon there. You can see those are just to see the, the, the pictures myself and our colleague uh, Tony Morphy and that's the actual paper which fittingly enough is in a free journal uh, the Eurodo journal and published there there this year so we'd like to invite any questions thanks for that Tom and Eamon so again if uh, there are any questions you'd like to ask feel free to raise your hand and we can get a microphone to you um, or uh, Feel free to put them in the chat as well. It's quite staggering the costs. <laughs> I'd, I'd never really <laughs> uh, seen those in black and white before. Yet to actually see them, and, and, and remember, we only just looked at educational technology journals. It's a it's a huge area out there, but I suppose. Um, Thanks, for Ryan. Um Yeah, I, I think yeah, when we were talking about po possible outlets, we we said we we better at least publish in an open journal. Um, do as we say, as well as we as as well as do as we do. Uh, but I think while we all have an idea of the figures, to actually see them laid out is 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 really is really staggering. As I say, Martin, I think someone wanted to come in there. Oh, sorry, was there a thing Anna wanted to put her hand? Yeah, so Lindsay has a has a has a comment there to Plan S prioritizing gold as opposed to diamond journals. Um, 
and that is true. They seem to be operating on an APC model that where you pay the APCs, and in many senses, it, it appears to be perpetuating the existing system. Like, it's a very difficult problem because the higher education institutions are entangled in this system with the publishers over a long time, and higher education itself is very expensive. So we are part of the problem as well. You know, it's not, we can't just blame all the publishers. That would be a bit easy. Um, and I mean, if you look at what's happening now with, I think, open education and OER and, and Creative Commons, we need to be pushing this and making sure we're, we're pushing it. Because if you look at what's happening now, you see all the providers that are making things available. Till July 1st, you can get full access to Audible kids books or, you know, big pusher opens their doors to X until the 6th. And they're all just opening the paywall to get customers. Then they'll close it and they'll monetize them. Like, so we need to be looking at things that are open from the ground up and that have open built in as a principle that they're accessible. And we need to figure out ways of funding that. And it's, it's going to be difficult. Yeah, I think to just responding there as well, Lindsay, about the, the plan S. Yeah, I think it's a bit disappointing where, um, what my fear will be is when uh, researchers and academics are putting in for for uh, European money, they'll put in an APC, so they're building it in. So the European Commission, the European Union, is then paying for, um, it, basically paying its, its its own money to to to, to put the, the money into the, the coffers of of private publishers. So I, I agree, it's it's it's. It's a bit disappointing if it's only going to be used that way. And I think we certainly should be moved more to uh, diamond and platinum journals. That that said, though, I suppose, like myself speaking, like you know, myself and Eamon and, and our other colleague Fiona Concanon, do a lot of work. But I suppose the thing is, like, when it comes to completely free open access journals, someone somewhere is paying. You know, like whether the the sponsorship body is having to to, to fund that, whether people are giving up their time. So. I think we also need to, to think about sustainability in some way. Is there any other, anybody else would like to raise an issue or I'm mindful of not hogging the time, Martin. No, we'll squeeze every last question out. <laughs> I think uh, generally uh, people are are, are very grateful for you, um, tackling this this topic and pro providing information about it. In terms yeah. of you, you know, there's uh, government governments increasingly are saying you know linking research um, to open open access publication. Uh, are 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 people just getting around that requirement? Uh, well, that's where I think some of the research gate was problematic. People meant well, but um, they were sort of sidestepping, I think, was one of the things. I don't know what you think, Eamon. Yeah, that's, I see a comment from Carolyn there as well. That's very true, Carolyn. But if something is Creative Commons, it should last forever. I think that's the value of journals can disappear. You put something in your institutional repository, you put in places. As Tom mentioned, there's, there is a study that we cite in the article, it, it, the name doesn't come to my mind now, where people are oversharing some things, they're putting them on research gate and contravening these licenses, and sometimes they're undersharing. They're not talking to the librarian, they're not putting it in an institutional repository. There's a national Irish repository that the National Forum hosts as well. Um, but to come back to, to Martin's question about whether funders are, are, there's research out there to show that funders who that people have not complied with the OA mandates of, of funders. Um, but, uh, and I guess like there's there's a kind of a, there's all these plans and everything else, but there's there's also a way to appeal to people's um, sense that like a lot of people are paid by the public person some way, they're public servants, they're, they're engaging in education, they may be being paid in taxpayers' money. If they're producing new knowledge, they should be giving that to the world and to the public, and they should, no one should be allowed to make money off that. They're already being paid for it, so the publishers shouldn't be paid, but neither should the, the, the scholars and the academics. They should be giving that back and putting that into the public domain so it can help the most people. And it can be the best research it can be as well, because you can validate it in more contexts and so on. 
there is some embargo for green yeah yeah but the preprint version you see you need you need to kind of talk to librarians because it's very complex probably purposefully so just to Taskin's comment but if preprint the one that you submit to the journal you usually have a huge number of rights over that and generally you can almost put that in without embargo straight away some Can, can I just jump in there and ask ask people um, how many people here have uh, published using the green open access options? Just surely yes or no, just a quick just it's just a matter of interest. Um, no. you know, so. Yeah, as I said, I, I, we, we suspect that, uh, you know, certainly it is being used, but I think a lot more people and, and can do it quite legally and get, get the material out there like that. So I think that's certainly an important uh, thing. I think one of the things that we're, we're certainly keen on looking at the open, ac uh, open access publishing as, as an open educational practice is simply, as I said, hoping that, you know, or believing in something because it's, it's a self-evident good and it's the right thing to do. I think we need to seriously look at, at how we do it. Um, the, the, I won't mention any specific publisher, but I mean, some of the, the money that some of those publishers are making is, is truly eye-watering on the back of, of of people's hard work. And the problem is as well, I think if we were going to look at it long term, we also need to look at the policies and procedures. How many people, if they're looking for tenure, if they're looking for promotion, if they're looking for grants, they are effectively forced to play a game which is asking them to, to make sure that their publication output is in high uh, ranking journals and getting it out. And uh, so, as I said, as I said, people may be philosophically committed to openness, but if they want to retain their position, they're often forced to make difficult decisions. Just we'll stop now. Hey, Eamon, oh, do you want yes. to have the... That's <laughs> <laughs> one I, of the other... Is, is like when, when you talk about that in terms of uh, career progression and, you know, whoever, so in the UK we have REF is, um, I, you know, certainly for the, the Alts Journal, one of the issues is impact factor. And, I, you know, as a, a platinum publication, I, sometimes we're not in that cartel um, and to impact factors which are controlled by, you know, the central publication, publication houses um, seem a, a bit harder to reach. Yeah, there's there's also like uh, as a there's there's the extrinsic motivate or the intrinsic motivators rather that people should be doing this as a public good and to be an open scholar and because it's because the right thing to do, you know, but also there is as you talk about, Martin, the pressures that academics are under to publish in certain prestigious outlets and so on. But what might persuade them as an extrinsic motivation is the open access citation advantage. And, and Piawar et al. Have, have a lot of research building that shows that like every public open access it has more impact. It's, it's purely common sense. It's intuitive. You can reach more people. It can affect more people. So there's, there's got to be a I think for, for that too. Um, and I think there should be more support and people in the ref should be able to say, well, look, I've, I've published in an open access and that should be in a, an open and accessible way. And that should be taken into account somehow. I think you're right. Well, on that note, um, I'm, uh, I think we'll call this, call this session to close and if we could uh, show our